Hey there folks, my name is Misadventurer, and welcome to the first episode of my Imperator Rome Let's Play as Ikenia. Now, you probably have a couple questions, but first let me just lay out some basic information here at the very start so you know what you're getting into and you feel informed about what you're spending your time watching, because I don't want you to feel like you're wasting your time on something that you're not going to enjoy, so that's just how I roll. We're playing on the 2.0.3 Marius update for Imperator Rome. This is the current and seemingly permanent version of the game uh, going forward. We will see what Paradox does in regards to this uh, stopping development of the game idea. I actually have a lot to say about Paradox and the way that they do game development, but that may come out later in a rant in the future of this Let's Play. Let's not start things off on that tone, shall we? <laughs> I'm also a brand new YouTuber. Hi there. Uh, this is my first video. It's live, so that's always a good idea for making a video. And uh, I may or may not be any good at being a YouTuber, or at playing Imperator Rome for that matter. We will see about that. I do have over 200 hours with the game, but that's just enough to feel comfortable, but not necessarily experienced with the current game version. A lot of those hours were before the big overhaul in the Marius update, and some of them were even before the big overhaul that came, I think, in 1.3. It was the big mana removal overhaul. If you're a fan of this game or the, the troubled history of this game, you'll know what I'm talking about. But either way, let's go ahead and get started. Now, this first episode, and by the way, these episodes will be around 30 minutes in length each. I may not even unpause the game in this first episode because there's a lot to talk about, a lot of setup to do, and a few more things I want to say about the series before we sort of get into it properly. Um, when it comes to Imperator Rome content on YouTube, there is a lot, well, there, there are a couple YouTubers uh, who make content for this game and for other Paradox games, and a lot of that content, it's pretty fast paced. People can play at speed three or speed four, pause every so often, maybe slow down during wartime, and kind of just coast along and do really well because they're very good at the game. I don't have a lot of time to learn this game inside and out. I have a lot of other stuff in my life, so playing this game is more of a passionate hobby for me, and um, because of that, I'm a bit more hesitant and a bit more cautious when I play. I tend to play on speed three, and I go down to speed two, during like tricky maneuvering during wartime or whatnot. And I'm also uh, someone when I play who pauses at the start of every month, or I would if this game uh, calculated everything at the start of every month the way that I wish it did. Uh, sometimes some things are calculated at a different time. Uh, actually, I think I may be thinking about Crusader Kings 3, which uh, to my endless rage uh, calculates things not at the start of the month when the game starts, but midway through the month because of the uh, Normandy start date. That's a whole other rant, and <laughs> maybe we'll get to that one too. But either way, I'll be pausing at the start of every month when I get my monthly ticks to kind of look at everything and take stock. And this level of carefulness and micromanagement may make it sound as though I plan to min-max my way to victory, but that's not the entirety of my playstyle. I also really enjoy the role-playing aspect of it, and unlike a game like Crusader Kings 3, which is really, I would argue, a role-playing game that looks like a grand strategy game, but is tricked us all and is actually just the most role-playing game that exists out there on the market, which I will actually argue about if you fight me on that one. Uh, Imperator Rome is a, a weird middle ground between role-play and grand strategy. Arguably, it leans more in the grand strategy direction, but there are a lot of ways to roleplay and a lot of potential for roleplay in this game, especially because it covers a period of history that is so rich in character drama, especially if you're thinking about it like that. Of course, you don't need to think about it ever, but if you want to roleplay as historically accurate figures who care about the things the real people cared about uh, from that time period, you of course can do so. The middle ground I take with this is... I will pay attention to the uh, character of my characters, their names I'll try to remember, and the most important characters I'll try to think about their traits when I'm making decisions through their point of view. However, this will never interfere with my uh, metagaming mindset. It's going to be kind of an extra thing I do, maybe it's something where I kind of have to 
explain what the character is thinking as they make a certain decision, if they're the leader of the country, for example, or maybe kind of reference an interesting thing about a character when we're dealing with them. But that being said, that's basically what this series will look like. A slow-paced, character-focused, long-term planning, super, like, uh, explanatory and, like, talked through and analyzed series playing as Ikenia. And that's one other thing I'll mention as well, the reason I'm calling them Ikenia. In this game, uh, many of the nations, and more specifically, many of the uh, settlements actually have the Latin names. Um, for example, Londinium is the Latin name for this location. I don't know offhand the Celtic name for it, but of course Londinium is the Latin name. And to be fair to Paradox, we don't really know the native names of a lot of places, aside from places in the Greek world or the East where the records are a bit better preserved. Uh, nations that didn't really have like uh, recorded libraries of stuff. Like all of this is like the Latin names for everything because we don't know what else it was called. Um, even if we knew the word, we, we just rem we just know now what the Latin version of the word is. So yeah. So because of that, uh, I thought I would try to practice my classical Latin pronunciation as I understand it, which involves a lot of odd, hard, Italian-sounding pronunciation. I promise I won't go overboard with it, but things like Ikenia instead of Icenia, I think, makes it feel a bit more period-appropriate. Of course, the Romans would have called this Ikenia. They would also would have called themselves uh, Roma, with that little kind of Italian pronunciation there in the city. Anyways, so that being said, we're not very close to the Romans at the start. Hopefully they don't get close to us very quickly, but we'll see what happens in this game. The big uh, historical empires sometimes form, but don't always do so. It's not a sure thing. And something exciting and unexpected may, of course, happen to change history, including what we're hoping to do, which is to change history for ourselves. And in that regard, we're hoping to unify our home islands um we're not going for the per, the uh what's it called perfidious albion i think it's called there's an achievement where you have to unify the albion um the british isles before 500 abc uh however um that's a pretty hard achievement to pull off and even though i will be playing carefully enough to be able to pull it off i'm not looking to accomplish it uh, especially because I believe it does involve a lot of colonization of the uncolonized land. That's expensive, and you have to kind of do that in a very specific way. So we're not going to worry about that. If we manage to be in control of the Isles by 500 ABC, that'll be pretty triumphant of us, but I am not looking to do that. We're just going to play a regular uh, Pratani Islander game and just uh, play it the normal way. Although I do have a bit of a devious opening strategy that we will see in this episode, so get ready for that. We are going to play with Iron Mode on, which you may think is a terrible idea for a Let's Play. You would be correct. However, I want to get achievements because um, I'm lame like that. I actually do like the achievements, and I don't really have any mods. In fact, I have no mods at all for this game because this game is extremely modder unfriendly when it comes to the checksum. Now, it's not necessarily modder unfriendly in general, but if you like to have that checksum working, you want to have your achievements enabled, that uh, any, basically any mod is a threat to it. Even UI mods often break the checksum, so I'm just going to leave that alone. We're doing a vanilla Imperator Rome with Iron Man enabled and achievements gainable. And you may notice and or laugh at the easy early game achievements I will be getting because I'm very bad at playing this game for very long and getting later achievements. So a little bit of my shameful secret revealed there. Hopefully part of why I want to do this Let's Play is to keep myself playing One Nation and really getting invested in it which maybe I shouldn't say out loud, but hey, I'm a new YouTuber. I'm gonna spill all the all the beans, reveal all the secrets about the uh, the craft. So <laughs> you're already getting the, the psychological interpretation of my ways, so be excited about that. We're gonna leave gender roles unchanged. The tribal nations of Pratania already have uh, gender co-equality, which is great, not just because I think it's like better than um, just male gender, just kind of conceptually, but it's actually better logistically because the same, there's going to be half of our population of like characters are going to be female, and many of them will be qualified to be in offices that they would just be locked out of arbitrarily. So 
you know, we're just going to go with it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, let's take a look at our actual starting position here. So let's go ahead and just call this Ikenia and start. Right. So again, in this first episode, we have 20 minutes left or so in this first episode. I may not even unpause. One thing I will do here at the very start is make the uh, executive decision to delete my navy. Now, I had thought about this before starting the recording. The reason I want to delete my navy, even though other contemporary nations around us do have little navies like this one, I do not think we're going to do almost any naval stuff early on. As a tribal nation, our naval abilities are pretty limited, and it's basically a big money sink where we'd be in a bit of an arms race with our neighbors to have the bigger navy with ships this rudimentary and with basically no like naval traditions of any sort. There's not really any tactics aside from just having more ships, and having more ships is essentially just a race of who can pay more money to get more ships. I would rather save the money for land army uh, costs and or infrastructure because as a tribal nation uh, getting your infrastructure set up is quite important as you have very limited income uh, and you need to get as much as possible from every source so all that being said this navy unfortunately will have to be abandoned so we're going to go ahead where is the button here it is disband unit we're going to lose these two ships in particular look at our income we have 184 now we have 2.01 this uh, number up here actually updates monthly. I don't know why this number can't update with the number in the economy screen. This has always been the case, so I hope that they fix this. That being said, I guess they're not going to fix it because the game is no longer being developed. So, yeah, anyways. <laughs> um, here is our starting situation. We are playing as a Kenya. We are a settled tribe. Tribal leaders are elected for life by a council of the clan leaders. This is a society that has come to settle permanently in its region, embracing a sedentary lifestyle, just like me, IRL. Now, as a settled tribe, we get one military idea and one oratory idea. And one other thing I should say, by the way, is that I won't be necessarily giving a tutorial for every mechanic in the game. So things like ideas and matching ideas um, that you choose to your... Uh, government like preferred ideas are concepts that I, I may allude to but I won't necessarily explain in detail so apologies about that I know this game is very complicated but if I uh, thought through how to explain every mechanic in this game uh, it'd be an even slower paced series than it already will be but either way when we do get those ideas matched up which I do intend to do because of these bonuses we get a 12% tribesman happiness, which in our tribesman-centric society, 71% tribesmen or so, that's a pretty strong bonus. We get 5% civilization uh, cap, I believe, or floor. I don't know the exact term. Uh, we'll have to see in the bonus section. And that's obviously good as a, a tribe. We're going to want to civilize and, and transition from a settled tribe to a more civilized government form in the near future. And lastly, that last modifier eluded me for a long time when I looked at that before, but I learned later that that actually is levy size modifier of all things. So 5% levy size, that's pretty good because our entire army will be made of levies for most of the early game as we are a tribe and have limited to no access to legions. I think we actually have no access to legions as a tribe because we don't have the law that unlocks them. So that's fun. <laughs> At the same time, though, uh, because our levies are so small, here is a tribe, the 5% modifier actually probably won't have any effect, but it is what it is. Anyways, um, let's see what else. Uh, we have Ikeni Heritage. Risen from relative obscurity, the Ikeni are a proud and fiercely independent people. Yes, indeed. So this gives us the uh, Ikeni bonuses of 5% national tax, which, again, as I said a moment ago, your income as a tribal nation, even a settled tribe, is going to be pretty low. So any bonus to your money gain is extremely important. The way that um, money in this game sort of works in a sense is it's like a uh, it's like a an upside down parabola, like a valley of a line, where on one end, having very little money, any amount of boost to that money uh, is proportionately very great. And when you have a moderate amount of money, uh, those bonuses feel less impactful. But the more money you have, the bon and for example, the higher base tax rate you have, the higher base commerce rate you have, 
those percentage bonuses start to feel really big again when you're at the other end of that valley. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about um, the value of the bonuses. I actually think that in a lot of ways this game is uh, like what's going on under the hood with the math calculations is the game and everything that you're touching with your interface is kind of an illusion. The real game is thinking about these bonuses and the relative weight that they have to your particular situation. And again, just as an example, if I have a national tax rate of one versus a national tax rate of 10, the relative value of 5% to each number is proportionately the same, but in actuality is quite different. So anyways, uh, that kind of like under the hood talk will probably come up a lot because I'm the sort of nerd who thinks about this stuff. <laughs> we also get to country civilization level of extra 5%, really, really strong for a uh, tribe. And you can see here our current level is 10%, plus five, plus five, plus 1% for our positive centralization as that increases, that will actually go up as well, so that's really solid. We want to be increasing our Civ level. It's already nearing the cap, so we want to try and get that cap up so that this growth continues to take effect uh, here in the capital um, of Venta Iconorum. Right, so we may actually be changing our capital in the future. I'll talk about that later, but uh, where was I? Lastly, our Malice, because something I like about this game is every heritage has two bonuses and a Malice, which is a much more balanced system, I think, than what they tried in Imperator Rome. Er, <laughs> this is Imperator Rome. Wow, I'm losing it already. What they tried in Europa Universalis. <laughs> um, so our Malice is improve opinion maximum minus 10%. That's a shame. But here on the Isles, uh, we are unlikely to make friends for very long. In the long term, our goal is to fully control this region and eventually further than that. So um, there's not really any permanent neighbors we plan to have for like a very long time where this would become an issue. And if we want to be friends with someone, it's not that hard to stay friendly with them as long as you kind of stay out of each other's way. And there are other ways to keep up a friendship, even with someone who may not like you. So it's not the worst malice. Uh, so overall, I do like these Ikeni, uh effects quite a bit. These are really solid for this particular strategy of being a settled tribe that is well situated to civilize really quickly, as it were. Now, we have eight territories here in the province of Akenia, part of which is actually controlled by our southerly neighbor, Treno Avantia. Um, and again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing all the terms correctly. It's possible I'm not. That's fine. Uh, I'm just going to do my best, essentially. Here in our actual territory, we do have our capital city of Venta Iconorum here in the plains. It's producing earthenware, so that's fine. We don't have a lot of citizens, and the Freeman output may not be super useful, but, you know, earthenware is an okay resource for a city to produce. The rest of our territory are settlements. We have the plains of uh, Garia Nonum, which are producing salts. The plains of uh, Brano, Dunana, Brano Dunum, which is also producing salts. And the uh, marsh of uh, Bramulovium, which is producing furs, which is a bit more useful for our tribal nation. Now, we also have the marshy areas over here, uh, Denevia, which is producing salts, uh, Derovigutum, which is producing iron, so we may have to build a mine in these marshes, hope it doesn't flood, and the, uh, that's a little roleplay comment from me to you, <laughs> and the marsh of uh, Camboritum, which is producing wood, some very soggy wood, no wonder we don't want to have a navy, probably not the most seaworthy ships are going to be made from this wood, from this marsh. Lastly, the dry plain of Dro Liponte, which is producing more furs. So we actually do start off with a surplus of furs. That's an experience decay bonus here in the capital. We also have quite a large surplus of salt. We'll have to sell some of that salt off to our neighbors. We may try to prioritize selling to the Gauls because we're not going to conquer the Gauls anytime soon. That being said, if we get only offers from other Pretanians, we're not going to turn up our nose we're not going to go on a. We're not trying to get Perfidious Albion, right? Like we're not going for that crazy achievement. So we're going to be pretty safe to trade internally to the other tribes here. Either way, though, 
Uh, since this is the capital, we get a Legion maintenance cost reduction, which is useless to us, but eh, it is what it is. We may actually want to sell off all of our excess salt entirely, uh, just because that bonus is not helpful to us at all. But each salt does give us local monthly food modifier, which uh, for a tribal nation should never be a problem for us ever, and in fact we'll exploit that in a moment. And then here's the earthenware uh, that's being produced in Venta Iconorum. For some reason we're not getting the uh, surplus bonus. That may take a moment to register, but when it does register that'll give us the frame and output. And then the wood is giving us manpower and the iron is giving us local tax. So great, nothing too crazy going on with the population distribution. Uh, you can see on the screen here how it's distributed. We have a lot of freemen and tribesmen all over the place. Uh, most of our people are tribesmen. And in the city we have, I think it's our single citizen in our entire nation is in that city. Oh, we have two citizens. Where's our other citizen at? Where is our other citizen at? We have a citizen up here, an, an intrepid citizen up here in Branodunum. Not sure what they're doing up there. We also have docks in Branodunum, or rather a port giving it pop capacity, uh, the ability to recruit ships, ship recruitment speed bonus, and migration attraction and migration speed. We're actually going to destroy this port. I don't think we need any ports in our nation right away. We can always build ports later. And since we're not gonna have a navy, this port could give us some free money by doing that. There we go. This territory is much better suited to being turned into a uh, resource production settlement anyways. And just for the sake of completion, down here in Akenia, in the part of Akenia we don't control, in Sinomagus, they're producing wood. In, these are all plains, by the way, in Combratovium, they're producing grain. And finally, we found ourselves a grain province. And over in uh, Aspalatorum, they're producing more furs. So, good to know. Now, if we take a look at our mission tree, we have the Matter of Britannia mission. Our fortunes await in foreign lands. The Britannia region has been considered part of our borders, yet much of it remains beyond our control. Make sure that it is brought under our influence one way or another. So we have to completely control the region of Britannia, which if you forgot, is this region, modern day England and Wales, essentially, just about. Start the mission. Consult the clan council. So this always does the same thing for Kenya. We get claims on Cortania, Dabunia and Kantiakia. If we take a look at where those are, these provinces. So here's a Kenya. Kantiakia is down here. Dabunia is here. And Quartania is here. So all the provinces around Kenya. So, however, um, this will take a year to, to occur. And in that time, all of our neighbors will also be doing their clan council consultations from their mission trees. So in a year, everybody will get claims on everybody and it's going to be a big mess. What will also happen in a year is a bunch of alliances will start to form. Now we have very little control over the AI tribes allying each other. And one of the ways that the tribe gameplay gets kind of hectic for a lot of people is at the start of the game, a lot of tribes, especially here in Britannia or in Gaul, are about the same power level as each other. And so it, basically when everyone forms these complicated alliance webs, no one's really able to start taking territory and getting more powerful than the others. And sometimes what ends up happening is the nations with a slightly larger size like Dabunia, Cortania, Brigantia, these slightly bigger nations with maybe a slight pop advantage, they eventually start to get the upper hand and then they snowball from there. It's not the same thing as, say, the Italian peninsula where it's very asymmetrical and Rome and Etruria are the obvious uh, overdogs and the other smaller nations get uh, reliably defeated every time. Similar things happening over here, of course. Although, of course, the uh, Anatolian region has a lot. It's like a big cluster of chaos that, of course, we'll be able to see even from over here. Anyways, but that being said, uh, it would take a year for our claims on all of our neighbors to finish. And so we probably don't want to ally any of these neighbors. Now, there is a neighbor near us who is not in any of the territories we get claims on. And I wonder if you've noticed who it is. It's actually Duratriga down here on the southern coast, uh, the nation down here. Duratriga does not have any territory in territory that we're going to get claims on, and therefore they make a very natural ally for us to, st to uh, get right here at the start. So we're going to go ahead and offer them the alliance. Yes. 
Okay, they have accepted our alliance due to their own choice. Very good. Now, all of these nations start off diplomatically isolated, and so we, at this moment, have the single alliance, which gives us a advantage if we were to fight someone without any allies. But if we waited a year, everyone around us would start to make alliances and it would become a big mess. However, there is a gamble that we can do to get a war going in a month instead of a year. And I say a month because the game has a hard lock of when you can declare wars that ends after October of the first year. So what am I talking about? It's a little thing called Summon War Council. Every 10 years, uh, tribes are allowed to summon the War Council to randomly give them a claim on a nearby province. Now it's a neighboring province and only two claims are generated, which means this is going to be a dice roll. Here's the plan. We need to get a claim on Trinovantia specifically. Now, the reason I want to take on Trinovantia first is, first of all, they control part of Akenia, and I want to unify my home province first and foremost. They're also a really obvious first target, because taking on Trinovantia places us inside the Kantiakia province, which puts us in a good position to then take on Kantiakia itself. So it gives it unifies our first province and places us inside of another province that we can then unify in our follow-up war when we get the claims on Kantiakia in a year. We can't get claims on them through the War Council because they don't neighbor us directly. Only uh, Dabunia, um, Coritania, and uh, Kantiakia neighbor us directly. However, the War Council isn't guaranteed to give us a claim on Trinovantia. So this entire Let's Play, this entire opening strategy, entirely depends on the random chance that the War Council gives us the Trinovantian claim as one of the two options. So cross your fingers, dear viewers, and let's see what happens. Whew, there it is. The gruff voice barking over the sound of carousing outside yields an atmospheric setting for the latest meeting of the Akenian War Council. In attendance are several of the council's most well-respected members. Uh, Kaeltrim, the author of several tactical treatises. Inamicus, a well-known rogue and philanderer. And Venutius, an advisor of uncertain standing. As promising and flawed arguments are proffered on all sides, the status quo descends eventually. Inamicus and Venutius agree on the necessity of curbing the Dabuni threat, whereas Kaeltrim opines that his preference lies in the plenteous lands of Trinovantia. It is up to us to determine the best course of action. We know the truth, and we know that Keltrim has the truth of it. We must prepare for war with Trinovantia. Now, I did say I'd talk about these characters, and if we take a look here, uh, Inamachius and Keltrim are two of the other tribal chiefs, extremely important characters in our nation that we will look at extensively in a moment. This other person... Ven, uh, Venutius. Who is he? Who actually is he? Is he in my court somewhere? No. He's just some guy. Okay, well, I don't care about him that much, but um, we were going to go ahead and click this option to get the claims on the Trinovantian province of Akenia. It even gives us the claims on the right province. This is the best uh, case decision for us. And we're getting uh, loyalty with Keltrum, who of the two chiefs has less loyalty currently, so that's actually probably the best outcome we could hope for. Unfortunately, we are going to annoy Inamicus, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's not going to be too severe of a penalty. All right. And now to round out the episode before we get into the war preparation proper. Let's take a quick look at our major characters here, our major players, and just quickly scanning. Our offices are just about uh, allocated fairly, so we're not going to worry about that too much. Our leader is Tribal Chief Donwin Divica. She is 23 years old. She is extremely, well, I mean, she's the ruler, so of course she's loyal. What I meant to say is she's extremely prominent, so that's ideal. Uh, she is 90 for being the ruler, and her family prestige is super high. It caps at 100, though. 50 popularity at the start, that is the normal way it works. And in terms of stats, she is above average. She has 7 martial, 9 charisma, 6 finesse, and 8 zeal. So that's pretty solid. She is daring, and she is trusting. Captains the world over are said to scan the horizon for any sign of Donwin. The sea is scattered with debris from her naval victories. Well, despite me uh, obliterating her navy, 
Uh, she um, apparently has a history as a naval commander, so that's a little bit unfortunate, but she has had to make some tough sacrifices for the sake of her nation's pocketbook. She gets an extra marshal. Her loyalty is reduced, but that's fine. She's the ruler. Her loyalty is stuck at 100. And if she were a commander of ships, the ships would do 5% more damage. Maybe in her lifetime, we will have a navy again. That is a bit of a long-term goal, but I suppose that can be her personal ambition. She's also trusting she can have one less rival and her loyalty is increased, so that doesn't mean anything, but it's fine. And as the ruler, her tyranny ticks down at a 0.05 per month extra amount. And if we take a look at that, that's actually a substantial amount of tyranny reduction that this adds. Uh, her very high charisma produces a lot of this, and the base is 0.02. So you'll notice that being trusting and having that high charisma means we could actually accrue quite a bit of tyranny, and this would still tick down at a pretty reliable rate. We may in fact be accruing tyranny through some certain ways that you will see pretty soon, which may or may not be related to how we're going to accrue money, but <laughs> you will see. And also quickly note her husband, the magistrate, Segovax Divicus. He is 21. He is 55 loyalty, which is oddly low given that his wife is the chief, but it is what it is. Uh, he has 10 prominence, so he's not very important. He has no popularity. He's not really a, a major political figure at all, so that's probably fine. And he has uh, about average stats. He's worse than his wife. 4 martial, 9 charisma, 8 finesse, 3 zeal. That's fine. In terms of character traits, he is loving and miserly. So he can have an extra friend, he has extra charisma, and if he were the ruler, he'd give us extra dip rep. A warm, and a warm heart and kind gaze can always be found with Segavax, and he is miserly. To Segavax, wealth is there to be owned, there just always seems to be more to collect. That's lower finesse, his holding incomes are increased. If he were the governor or the ruler, the tax rate would go down. So, good thing he is neither. Now, I know we're slightly over time, but I will quickly note the other two tribal chiefs, because they are quite important characters in our realm. The more loyal now because of that decision I took, Kaeltrum Orgatoris is the chief of the Orgatorii clan. Now, our main character, by the way, she's the chief of... Where is the character menu? She's the chief of the Divicii clan, so let's keep that in mind. So, he is 29 years old. He is unnoticeable and an ore master, another uh, casualty of my reckless abandonment of the seas, unfortunately. Fortunately, though, his loyalty seems to be fine despite that. <laughs> Hopefully, he didn't notice. Extra naval movement speed and martial if he were a commander. Keltrum knows just how to squeeze every last ounce of energy out of a rowdy team of oarsmen. He also is unnoticeable, which is pretty solid given that he is one of our uh, natural rivals as another chief. That's a super reduced prominence, minus 30 prominence. Attraction as air is way down. Great Wonder Construction is reduced. Um, and if you were the governor, the province commerce would suffer. Now let's take a look at the final chief, the one that we annoyed in order to get the claim that we needed. Mr. Inamicus Urcus of the Urcii clan. He's 30 years old. He is of sort of dubious loyalty right now, but this will increase later. We will find ways to get him back up. His prominence is quite high, though, because he does not have any prominence reducing traits. In terms of traits, though, he is deceitful and he is trusting a very interesting combination of traits. He gets extra corruption, he gets extra finesse, and his loyalty is reduced, so that may be part of his loyalty problems. But he is also trusting, so similar trait as our husband let me double check that as ourself actually okay so those are the major characters of a realm and next time on the akeni playthrough or whatever this series will be called you will see and you will know because it will be the name of the video and of the playlist but i don't know yet because i am recording it live next time we will actually begin our preparation for war with Trenovantia in a daring and sneaky maneuver that will bring in our ally Duratriga against an allyless Trenovantia, breaking the early meta of the tribes through our cheeky strategy and beginning our probably quite long-term conquest of Britannia. So thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. Please leave me a comment letting me know how I did. 
constructive feedback and unconstructive feedback is both welcome. It helps with uh, the analytics. <laughs> and if you enjoy this content, consider subscribing so that I know my weird style of play is enjoyed by somebody except for me. I'm not anticipating any of that, but maybe you can surprise me. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you all next time.